Well, we've been talking together about the uh, Word of God, and uh, this morning we're going to continue just with a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of history about the New Testament and its authenticity. You remember last week we were talking about, or last time we were together, it's been two weeks since I was here, uh, we were talking about the uh, discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus and how in, um, in the musty library, if you please, the piles of old manuscripts there in, in St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt, there was discovered a, an ancient manuscript which contained the entire Old Testament and New Testament. The, uh, the most complete of all the manuscripts and what was believed to be one of the most ancient. And as further um, study would reveal, the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, we now believe, was one of those manuscripts that were commissioned by the Emperor Constantine in 331. And um, along with the Codex Vaticanus, these, uh, these uh, manuscripts exist as the earliest of the complete, uh, I guess you would say, uh, copies of the, the Old and New Testament. However, even though this compared favorably with the rest of the uh, manuscripts that were in existence then, even though there, were, there was good evidence from the Codex Sinaiticus that the Bible hadn't been tampered with by rash and, and, uh, and uh, dishonest hands. There were still the critics who said, wait a minute, that would have been in the 4th century, 331, when Eusebius was commissioned by Constantine to to make these 50 copies of the New Testament, or of the Bible. What about between the 1st century, when the Bible was supposedly supposedly written, and all the way down to the 4th century, when these earliest manuscripts have have been found? What about that? Um, If they were indeed uh, written by the apostles... Perhaps they should be discovered. Um, manuscripts earlier should be discovered. And so the, the question was, the challenge for the Christian believers in the Bible was to produce the merest fragment of a manuscript but between the first century, and you can fill that in if you're following along in your little note sheet here, between the first century and the fourth century when these various codexes were supposedly um, written. Now, the critics had something on their side. It's called science. They believed that this was rather impossible, that a mere fragment even of the New Testament would be discovered, even if it had been written by the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, as the believers uh, insisted it had been. The reason was because in the 4th century, the material that that was being used was sort of like a leather-type material we called vellum. And um, vellum was very durable, and it would last through the centuries. V-E-L-L-U-M was the, um, was the name of the, this material. But the earlier manuscripts would have been written not on vellum, but on papyrus. Now, papyrus was a more um, uh, plant-based material, and it was like paper you would, you would uh, consider today. And you know how paper is rather fragile, right? Even the books that were written, I, I have a love for books. And um, in my library, I have many books that were written in the 18th and early 19th centuries. And so they're, they're, um, they're dating back not far, f- I mean, closer to the time when the printing press and modern paper was invented. And what we didn't realize was that there was, there was in, in many papers, there was acid and other... Um, uh, the pH of the paper would determine the fact that over time that paper would sort of self-destruct. It would basically dissolve itself. So some of my old books you have to be very careful with because the paper is very fragile. Well, imagine paper lasting for 2,000 years. I mean, come on. And so the critics knew that papyrus was not likely to have lasted from the first century all the way down to the 19th or 20th century when they were making these claims. Now, as we, as we look at history, however, we can see that step by step, older and older evidences were discovered that would lead us today to conclude that the Bible, in fact, is reliable. And we're going to look at some of those steps yet this morning, talking about the New Testament particularly, because we already talked about the Old Testament in previous uh, visits together. The first discovery after... after um, 1859 and the, um, 
the discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus. Um, the first such discovery was by a Mrs. Lewis and a Mrs. Gibson. Now, they are, they are interesting people because they are both Orientalists. They are both professors at Cambridge, Cambridge University. They were uh, professors in Oriental Studies. And um, these Mrs. Uh, Lewis and Mrs. Gibson were twin sisters. And they were working together. They were professors together. And they were doing research together. Now, they went all the way to the Sinai Peninsula, to the, to the monastery there at St. Catherine's, and they began to try to get access to those mountains and mounds of moldering manuscripts. And uh, you remember, after, after um, Tischendorf, Dr. Tischendorf had borrowed the Codex Sinaiticus and then not returned it, given it instead as a gift to the Tsar of Russia, the monks at St. Catherine's were not that interested in letting the Westerners come back in and take their uh, manuscripts. And so it took two twin sisters to break down the barriers that had been erected, and eventually these ladies won the confidence of these monks, and they began to go through those manuscripts again. The first thing they found was not actually a copy of the, the whole Bible, but it was a partially erased Syriac copy of some of the Gospels that all the experts agreed had to have been written before the year of 200 A.D. Now that's backing us up 131 years, at least, from where the Codex Sinaiticus was. This is the a copy of the Syriac New Testament, or Gospels, that these two sisters, these twin sisters, found in St. Catherine's Monastery. Now, before the world hardly had opportunity to react to these sisters' um, discovery, Dr. Ezra Abbott made another discovery, and this was a commentary of the four Gospels in Armenian, which, again, the experts were forced to agree, had to have been written around the year, or even before the year, of 170 A.D. 170 A.D. Now, this, these contact, these, uh, this, this commentary was actually, we know now, was a translation into Armenian of a commentary that had originally been written in Greek. And so a few years later, well, a number of years later, actually, we come down to 1920. And uh, 1920, a group of British Army officers made a, a discovery at Dura, which uh, was right on the banks of the Euphrates River. They found an ancient Roman fort, and the Romans had actually built this fort, as I recall the, the history, they, they had built the fort from ruins of a church. So they were sort of excavating down through the different civilizations. There had been The Roman ruins were the most obvious, but as they continued excavating, they found the ruins of a Christian church. And in the ruins of the Christian church, they found fragments of this original Greek commentary, the same one that Dr. Ezra Abbott had discovered in Armenian, they found this commentary, or pieces of it, in Greek, the original language they believe it had been written in. Now, from the basis of this excavation of the old church, they could date this Greek commentary all the way back to the year 150. So this pushes it back another 20 years from the Armenian text. Do you understand? So the, the time is marching backwards piece by piece, it's not looking so good for the critics of the New Testament because this is, the, this is the point that was being made. If there was a commentary on the banks of the Euphrates, on the Gospels in the year 150, that means that the Gospels themselves had to have been written before that, right? And that means that they had to have been written long enough before for them to have been circulated and for the commentaries to have been written. It also means that they had to have been around long enough for those Gospels to be considered authoritative, to be, to be um, respected, and to be commented upon, right? They was, these weren't just ordinary letters that someone may have found along the way. These were books that scholars were commenting and writing commentaries on. Now, moving a little bit further, we find an, uh, more evidence being amassed we see in 1930 a large library of biblical papyri. Now, this is the amazing thing. While the experts thought that the papyrus would not survive the centuries, 
God preserved various pieces of papyrus in different ways. In this situation, he, um, it, he, had, he preserved it through the dry, arid conditions of the desert in Egypt. The desert st- sands kept this papyrus, this delicate material, uh, intact for those centuries. And um, in the Egyptian Coptic graveyard, how do you like finding manuscripts in a graveyard. (laughs) But this is what happened. In 1930, a large library of biblical papyri was discovered in an Egyptian Coptic graveyard near the Nile. And um, this is known today as the Chester Beatty Collection. And as I recall, it is actually um, owned and preserved today at the University of Michigan. And so um, if you wanted to take a look at this collection, it's not that far away from us today. This contained 12 manuscripts. Um, I believe there were eight from the Old Testament, three from the New Testament. It, these manuscripts included the Gospels, Acts, and all of Paul's letters. And it is agreed that these would have dated back to around the year 8200. Now, I realize that's a little after 150. But again, this is showing that all the way in Egypt, where the Christian church was, um, not just in um, in what we would today call Iraq, but throughout the entire region, the Bible was being disseminated, being spread. And that takes time to happen when it's all being done by hand and being carried by hand. It's not like email. It gets from one place to another very quickly. So this is, we now know these books were being revered long before the critics were saying they had even been written. But perhaps the most interesting, the oldest fragment of all, it wasn't even preserved by Christian hands at all. And to me, this is an amazing story because I can imagine some sacrilegious person who didn't believe in the Christian faith at all was taking these sacred scriptures of the Christians and tearing them into pieces and using them for trivial, ordinary pursuits. Isn't that sort of sacrilegious? I mean, they didn't believe in it. And so might as well, right? But what they didn't know was that in treating the scriptures in this way, they would be providing the world with the greatest evidence yet of their antiquity and authenticity. Some careless, irreverent, non-Christian hands used portions of the Gospel of John to wrap an Egyptian mummy. And scientists would be discovering this mummy in the 20th century. And uh, this Egyptian mummy, we believe, was wrapped from the rest of the evidence in this mummy's tomb, was wrapped with portions of the book of John in the first half of the second century, between, between 100 and 150. Doubtless, the oldest fragment that we have still today, preserved <laughs> not by Christians who wanted to give us evidence, but preserved by someone who probably wanted to destroy the Bible and thought it is inconsequential. Wrapped around Egyptian mummy and then discovered today. It's not a large fragment. It's not much larger than the size of a man's hand. It contains um, a portion of the book of John, but it's clear evidence that the Bible, as early as 100 AD, which we would say was only 10 years or so after John wrote the gospel, or we don't know, sometimes between... late 80s and 100 that we believe John wrote the gospel, the gospel of John had already been carried down to Egypt by the early part of the next century and um, was being used to wrap an Egyptian mummy. God is good, isn't he? And God, I believe, had his hand over his scriptures. I believe that there is, it is not an accident that the Bible is the most authenticated book of antiquity. And I want you to just fill in the blanks here. If you, I don't care if you fill in the rest, it's, but I think this is very impressive. Um, if you get to our last point here, the manuscript evidence for the authenticity of the New Testament far exceeds that of any other document in history. Let me give you the numbers. The number of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, over 5,300. Now, they're not all as old as, as uh, obviously the Codex Sinaiticus, but Preserved around the world in the Eastern Church and also in the Western Church, we have these manuscripts and um, there's an amazing agreement between them. 5,300 what would be considered ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. Copies of the Latin Vulgate.